So I met Train and, and Jimmy, and, and I got to uh, be friends with Alvin and Jimmy. McCoy was kind of standoffish, you know, he was, I, I didn't understand, but that's just the way he was, because when he wasn't doing the music, he was really in constant meditation and, and, or in prayer. So I got to meet Alvin and, and Train and, and all of them early on, you know, and uh, it, it was quite remarkable. And then my actual conversation, deep transforming conversation with Train was later on in D.C., uh, some years later. Um, and uh, I remember after the gig, Rashid Ali was playing with him at that time. And uh, after the gig, they were playing at the Bohemian Caverns. And we're all falling train back to the dressing room and stuff. And, and I go, Mr. Coltrane, I'll be glad when I get good enough to play with you. And he stopped. So the, everybody that was falling stopped. And he turned around and he said, what'd you say? I said, I'll be glad when I get good enough to play with you. He said, what do you play? I said, drums. He paused for a minute and he said, listen, you're good enough to play with me right now. And I went, <laughs> he said, no, listen, you are good enough to play with me right now. Don't ever play with anybody that thinks they're, that you're not good enough to play with them. If they think that you're not good enough to play with them, they're not good enough to play with you. He said, don't ever forget that. He said, just be yourself and play. And, you know, uh, he, Paused for a moment. He said, "Oh no, we got, we got a, we're leaving tonight. Tonight was the last gig." Uh, so he said, "If we weren't leaving tonight, I would ask Mr. Ali for you to use his drums, and you and I would play in this club, just me and you, all night long." He said, "But we got to go to the next next city, so I, I can't do that. But if we ever get a chance," he said, "You and I are going to play." And we ne we never got the chance, you know, but. But it stuck with me that he was like that. And when I saw him times after that, he was reading um, Eastern philosophy books or, or spiritual books, you know, because he, he was like following Skachananda, the guru. And uh, um, so there, there's this thing within this music that transcends what people call jazz. There's a spiritual aspect to it that is just and it was trained to me that kind of woke everybody up for real, you know, because he was able to, when, when he did A Love Supreme, A Love Supreme, think about that for a minute. The supreme of it all, the love for that. And realizing that we're all connected to this supreme energy, you know, and with his music, you know, acknowledgement, prayer, you know, um, um, meditation, especially meditation. When he did that, it, it was like, wow, I got it. I really started feeling the aspect of the um, metaphysical side of the music, you know, and I, I, I started really working on, on, on just doing that. There's a Mathematical, uh, you know, it's kind of like quantum physics, really, when you think about the music. You know, like Train playing 64th notes and writing it down. <laughs> that's the part that fascinates me. He was able to write that down. I mean, you understand 64, that, that's, that's speed. That's you know, and when you think about quantum physics and you think about the string theory and all that, it's all connected. So it transforms and transcends jazz. It goes beyond that whole thing of what people want to call jazz. It goes beyond the whole thing of it being just music. It goes into the metaphysical realm of touching your soul.